This is CBC Here and Now. When my stop arm is activated, they just breeze through as if I'm not there. And we're here on the horns leaning as well. I mean, trying to get our kids off the bus safe. There's an arm, a stop sign, and flashing lights. But some CBS drivers still are not stopping for the school bus. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Well, it's pretty hard to miss a big yellow school bus, red lights flashing, and that stop sign that sticks out on the side. But many people still ignore the signs, and that's putting some students at risk. It has been a problem in Conception Bay South for years, and one bus driver is pleading with the public to stop, literally. Here and Now's Carolyn Stokes has more. Every driver knows that this is the signal to stop. So students getting off the school bus can stay safe, but an alarming number of drivers just blast through the school bus stop sign, especially on this busy four lane stretch of highway through CBS, but sometimes they get caught. On this day, they were caught by our camera and an unmarked police car. School bus driver Joe Pilgrim says disregard for the law is rampant. It's an epidemic in my opinion. When my stop arm is activated, they just breeze through as if I'm not there. Every day, every day, it never fails that there's a number, more some days than others. Uh, I've counted as many as uh, 13, 14. He remembers one heart-stopping moment in particular, watching in horror as a truck sped towards the bus as some children were stepping off. One little girl was out by the front of the bus and I blew the horn, the other one was going down the steps and I grabbed her by the hood of her coat and, and yelled and they didn't know what was going on. But I tell you, it was scary. All I could see is two little girls squashed on the street. It's not just Pilgrim who's fearful for the children's safety. Every day, a posse of fed up parents make noise, hoping drivers will pay attention. Daily, twice a day, even the a high school bus, junior high bus, you see cars blowing through. I mean, Joe starts his flashing lights down there on, on the corner of Elliott's place, and he'll drive slow until the cars stop, and we're here leaning. Well, you witnessed it today, and we're here on the horns leaning as well. I mean, trying to get our kids off the bus safe. Police say they get almost daily complaints from concerned bus drivers and the public. We should as drivers anticipate that that bus is going to stop. If caught passing a school bus stop sign, the vehicle owner faces a range of fines upwards of $1,200, plus six demerit points, not to mention making their insurance more expensive, and that's the best case scenario. A child can be significantly injured if not killed uh, as a result of being struck by a vehicle in this area. And it's not just police who can catch offenders, anyone can do it. If people came forward to the police with the license plates, uh, we will gladly issue a ticket to the driver. Uh, of course, the caveat is that if the person uh, contests the ticket, then the person who witnessed the offense may be required to go to court. A small price to pay, says Pilgrim, when you consider what's at stake. They're children, they're carefree. They could run across the road in front of the bus and not even think what they're doing. So be extra careful when you see a school bus and you see those lights flashing. For goodness sake, stop because you could kill a child. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, Conception Bay South. The regatta committee is looking for someone to sell beer during the annual event. I was really excited actually. This is something we probably should have done a few years ago and then when we heard yesterday we the timing was perfect. I'll have more on that story coming up on Here and Now. I hope you got outside today if you were anywhere on the Avalon absolute or on the island rather absolutely gorgeous day today. Uh, temperatures topped out at 13 degrees, apparently 61 in Terranova. That's clearly a mistake, but uh, temperatures were quite warm. Double digits right through to uh, Deer it's Lake. It's always warmer in Terranova. <laughs> yes. Just ask Debbie. She knows. <laughs> that's true. Debbie does know that. Uh, yeah, but 61, I think that's uh, that's not right. Uh, but as far as uh, what we're going to see as we head 
that through the overnight tonight. So we've got uh, a little bit of a sea breeze going on anywhere along the northeast coast. We're in that northeasterly flow, so some fog and uh, some drizzle will develop for that. Otherwise, we're looking at a beautiful evening tonight. The next system already moving through Labrador. If we zoom out a little bit, you can see how large this low pressure system is. That's going to be our weather maker as we head through the weekend, but I'll have all those details coming up. Well, new government, same faces. Dwight Ball unveiled his cabinet this afternoon, giving us a glimpse at who is going to lead key departments in this province. Here now is Ryan Cook joins us now from our newsroom. So Ryan, not too many surprises. No surprises really today. Uh, you, you might remember on election night, uh, Dwight Ball said that the voters had sent a message, but it's pretty clear now that he didn't interpret that as a message for total change because today we saw 11 of the 12 cabinet ministers who were sworn in are the same as the ones who were there before the election. One by one, they came down the aisle and took their seats. Osborne, Mitchell Moore, Crocker, Byrne, the list goes on. There was only one new face today, the province's new education minister, Brian War. War is a businessman from Springdale, so where does education fit in? Uh, no, I don't have an education uh, background. What I do have a background in is, is certainly management and, uh, and working with people, uh, good people, and, uh, you know, and certainly this department is, uh, is no different. The Liberals lost two cabinet ministers in the election. Well, maybe. It was announced today that Lisa Dempster is minister of two departments, including Graham Leto's old post at Municipal Affairs and Environment. Are you holding out Graham Leto's seat for him if he wins the recount? I am. If Graham Leto is, you know, fortunate enough to come through, well then obviously he will go back into uh, the department and the minister responsible for uh, municipal affairs and the environment. Uh, if not, well then we'll make a decision on who the next minister will be. Ball also made the decision to keep himself as minister of Indigenous Affairs rather than give it to somebody in Labrador. This despite the party losing two seats in Labrador and any message that might have sent. There's work to be done. And right now, that portfolio, those, uh, those responsibilities will remain for my office. Questions are, when will the House reopen and when will a budget be passed? Well, today, Ball said that June the 10th is the earliest possible date that the House could reopen. They'll start with the throne speech, then they'll begin debating the budget and hopefully pass it. And again, he committed to tabling the same budget that they came up with before the election. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Ryan Cook. The Transportation Safety Board is investigating the death of a man who fell off a fishing vessel between Labrador and Greenland. The 52-year-old went overboard Tuesday evening about 400 kilometers east of Nain. He was aboard a vessel called the Newfoundland Victor. A team of investigators from the TSB have been sent to the area to investigate along with police. A 35-year-old man has been charged for allegedly stealing an ATM from the hospital in Gander. The theft was captured on videos you see there, and the RCMP is also looking for a second person. Central Health confirmed the theft and said it was the first time the machine at James Patton Memorial Hospital was stolen. The man has been charged with theft over $5,000 and will appear in court on August the 20th. Well, the fire chief in Grand Falls, Windsor says a stubborn fire this morning kept them busy. Fire broke out at this house. Chief Vince McKenzie says the fire challenged his crews, but no injuries were reported. Fire officials had to close roads this morning while they battled the flames. The St. John's Regatta Committee is looking for someone to run this year's beer garden. Well, last night, we told you how the Kinsman Club, the group that's been running that beer tent for the last 37 years, they're walking away from it. They're saying the Regatta Committee is simply too arrogant. Here now is Meg Roberts has this update. Have no fear, beer will be here come Regatta Day. The only question is, who is serving the drinks? The St. John's East Kinsman Club pulled out this year saying the Regatta Committee is disrespectful and arrogant. This is after asking to see their finances and raising the fees. The committee says it's disappointed to see the kinsmen pack up, but after discussing it at a meeting last night, the regatta is ready to move on. They do great work in the community, so um, obviously, you know, we look forward to what we can do to replace the, the, uh, the great work that they've done. And as a result, you know, we're going to be fully open and transparent on this and go to an RFP. And of course, you know, if the Kinsmen decide to, we would certainly welcome them applying just like everyone else. Fees for rowing crews and vendors have gone up 10% this year, and that's caused some criticism. But the committee says it's a costly operation. 
keeping rowing fees down for young people and offering free programming in the fall. The president says just a set of oars costs $6,000. Everything gets expensive every year. Uh, the regatta committee absorbs that. Every single dollar we spend, we scrutinize. The committee says about a dozen people have already shown interest in operating the beer tent. One of those is Kitty Vitty Brewery, who, if selected, has big plans for the event. We'd like to do something similar to what we did with the Folk Fest last year, and it's change it from more of a beer tent to a beer garden. So we'd add a bunch of nice seating, have some pallet couches where you could sit out and look at the races, and offer a selection of beer from across Newfoundland. It's not clear yet when the public will find out who will be behind this year's beer tent, but in the same spirit of the Kinsman, the regatta says any organization donating money to charity will rise to the top of the list. So while the weather is always a gamble down here by the lake, it looks like beer will be a sure thing. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. A homeowner in Musgrave Harbor says he's been left holding the bag because no one will take ownership of an abandoned building next door. Steve Butler says the structure is getting worse and he can't get any answers. Here now is Garrett Barry has that story. You can look at the eaves on the building are all rotten. Just a few feet between his property and theirs. So? Siding blows off. I picks it up. So the vents blow it off to the roof, I'd pick it up. And if the glass breaks in front, you guessed it. And my little boy had his head in through there. So it was only for this to let go, and it had been a serious problem. And like I said, I was the one that had to tape it up. It's not that he wants to, just no one else will do it, and it can't be ignored. Well, nobody knows who owns it, so uh, BDC and Grand Falls, they're Apparently the lien owner and they're saying they don't, they don't own it so there hasn't been anybody there in the 10 years that I've been here so. He says he's looked everywhere but no answers. So we gave it a try too. We called BDC, the company whose 2008 mortgage loan gave them a right to take this land. Looking for some information about that building, you know, what the plans are for it. If I but they haven't answered our questions. And as for the mayor, he said no interview. I'd just like to get some answers on what they're going to do or if anybody's going to do anything. The neighborhood isn't all on the same page. I spoke with a couple of nearby residents who say that this abandoned building isn't that big of a deal. But Butler believes if you were standing here and living this close, you'd understand his point of view. Basically, he's in it alone. And whoever owns this place, he's got a message for them. Just because it's in a small community, they figure they can, you know, just leave it and the town and the taxpayers and Musgrave Harbor will be responsible for to clean it up. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. He says these owners aren't just abandoning their building, they are abandoning their responsibility too. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Musgrave Harbor. If you've ever been anywhere near a basketball court, then you know that tonight is special. Canada's team, the Toronto Raptors, are in the NBA Finals, a night 24 years in the making. We will set up this historic series right after the break.
A man from George's Brook Milton is speaking out about his issues with the kidney transplant program in Atlantic Canada. Jim Patton says he has a donor who's a match, but he's lost hope that he'll ever get the life-changing surgery. Jen White has our CBC investigation. They failed me. They, they, they absolutely failed me. Uh, from British Columbia, their renal system, to the renal system here in Newfoundland, it's a disgrace. Jim Patton was recovering in hospital after surgeries to remove his right leg. He's groggy because he just finished dialysis, a treatment he's been getting since he was diagnosed with lupus 15 years ago. But it wasn't until 2012, while living in British Columbia, that he and his doctor decided it was time for a kidney transplant. Patton's daughter was a match. Yes, I was number one on the list and in my age group. But that same year, a life change brought him back home to Newfoundland. Patton says he was told he had to redo all of the tests he'd done in B.C. A process he thought would take six months took two years. The ones I'd done before that were over a year old, so I had to redo them again and redo them again. And when he got in to see the specialist who had written the letter previously, the specialist actually said to him, are they trying to push you off until they can say you're too old? Jim Patton's file was finally completed, but it was turned down by the transplant program in Halifax. He later asked Eastern Health's transplant coordinator to send the file back for a second look. But when he called for an update, he got a surprise. She said, your file never left my desk. And she said, besides, you got lupus and you wouldn't be considered. Both Eastern Health and the Nova Scotia Health Authority, which runs the transplant program in Atlantic Canada, said they can't comment due to privacy legislation. But in general terms, anyone who meets the criteria to safely participate in the program is considered. The amount of testing is based on a person's health and can vary depending on factors like pre-existing conditions or age. Eastern Health says it works one-on-one -on -one during the application process. Less complicated cases can be completed within months, while others may require additional follow-up testing and may take additional time to process before the chart is completed. It's then sent to Halifax, where it's reviewed by a committee for several months. For Jim Patton, those months and years continue to tick by. I'll never get on the list, not now. Uh, I'm just doing this so other people won't get screwed over like me. And I believe in all my heart that I was totally screwed over. And if it only helps one person, it could be worth it. People like him who have someone who will donate a kidney to them should have a more straightforward and transparent system than the one that exists now. Patton says dialysis has kept him alive, but it has also caused multiple health problems. And now, more bad news. Months after having his right leg removed, he needs to have his other leg amputated as well. Well, it's been very hard watching him in pain and suffering, certainly. And he should never have had to suffer as much as he did. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. Well, we will turn a corner now and, mm. and talk about the weather, which was absolutely gorgeous in many parts of the island, as you were saying, 61 in Terra Nova. <laughs> Which someone pointed out is exactly 16, well not exactly, but close to 16 degrees Celsius. So. Uh, <laughs> that was the mistake. Yeah, that was a mistake, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but yeah, an absolutely beautiful day today. Uh, temperatures in the teens, we'll take a look at those one more time because they were so nice. Uh, 13 in St. John's, 16 in Badger. Corner Brook, similar temperature. And then along the northeast coast, temperatures in the single digits. And then 
we saw a sea breeze develop and it dropped those temperatures down. So this is where we're sitting right now, anywhere from about eight degrees in St. John's to four to six degrees along the northeast coast. Uh, Lab City sitting at eight right now, and then we've got uh, 10 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay, and those temperatures still in the teens along the west coast, except for Port of Basque sitting at nine right now. Taking a look at the setup, uh, we do have a large area of low pressure. This will be our weather maker as we head through the next couple of days anyway. We're going to start to see some of that cloud cover uh, push further and further east uh, for Labrador. Otherwise, the island still clear as we head through the night tonight. Parts of the island anyway. We're actually going to see a onshore flow as we head through the night tonight. So that is the recipe for drizzle and fog. So anywhere along the northeast coast, we'll likely see that. It should lift by morning, uh, but overnight tonight, not uh, not exactly the best weather, but not the worst either. Uh, we're still looking at clear skies for the most part for the rest of the island. And then that low pressure system, like I was talking about bringing in, uh, we saw some clearing skies for Lab West. That's going to bring that cloud cover back in with that uh, periods of rain and snow as we head through the overnight tonight. So here's a look at your temperatures. Uh, there's that onshore flow is talking about winds generally light though around 15 kilometers per hour, one to two degrees uh, up through St. Anthony or really anywhere we could along the northeast coast. We could see some freezing drizzle along with that. Wouldn't be surprised to see that. Cornerbrook four degrees light wind, same for Port of Basque and then three degrees for Marystown tonight. Along uh, the Labrador coast, still looking at either rain, snow or freezing drizzle tonight. Happy Valley Goose Bay periods of rain will move in and three degrees in Lab City again, seeing that uh, periods of rain change over to snow. So you'll see that by the time you wake up tomorrow. That low will continue to track a little bit further east as we head through the day tomorrow. Happy Valley Goose Bay getting into that rain. And then uh, we should see the fog lift, like I mentioned, for the island. And then cloud cover will push back in through the day, thanks to that system, with some shower activity along the west coast, south coast, and eventually spreading across the island as we head towards the morning hour. So here's a look at your temperatures, sitting around 10 degrees for St. John's, a little bit cooler further south, Placentia 9, 11 for Marystown, 10 for Bonavista, and again, some... Uh, peaks of sun in the first half of the day. Heading towards Grand Falls, Windsor should reach a high near 17 degrees. Harbor Breton going to see that rain move in a little bit earlier, likely only reaching a high near nine. Uh, anywhere really along the south coast with that uh, potential for some showers. Late day for Corner Brook, Gross Morn uh, with that uh, Cloud cover moving in right along with that. St. Anthony, six degrees tomorrow. Same up through Cartwright around seven, either rain or snow again. And then messy for the rest of uh, Labrador. Churchill Falls only reaching a high near four degrees. Uh, Labrador City at six and Happy Valley Goose Bay at seven. So that's a look at your forecasts. We all want to know what the weekend looks like. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. A little bit of good news here in the entertainment vein. A crime-fighting dog who stars in his own television show will be back for a second season. Now, this show is shot in and around St. John's. City TV has announced it is renewing Hudson and Rex for at least another year. Hudson and Rex stars a German Shepherd who helps his human partner, actor John Reardon, capture bad guys in and around the city. City TV says it has become its highest rated original scripted series in four years. Two and a half million viewers took in the first six episodes. And uh, the show is locally produced by Pope Productions. What are some of those tra traits for a fire? Okay, well, from Rex to the Raptors after 24 years, more than 1,900 regular season games and years of playoff disappointment. Tonight, the Toronto Raptors are in the NBA Finals. That is a first in franchise history. I mean, it's history. Just, yeah, exactly. It's history. This is historic. Even you speaking to us right now is historic. Where we're standing right now is historic. The time, the day, the moment. We're not at work. We're here with you. <laughs> so, fans have been filing into Jurassic Park since the early hours of the morning in downtown Toronto, just a couple of blocks from the CN Tower. <laughs> wow, look at them. It's where thousands have been going wild, cheering on the team during this historic playoff run. The Raptors are up against a dynasty, though, the Golden State Warriors, who are looking for their third straight NBA championship. Well, here at home, there's a basketball tournament that's happening right now at Gonzaga High School in St. John's. Perfect place to set up a big game. And that's where our here now Zach Gowdy is joining us live. Zach? 
What does this mean for Canadian basketball fans, this moment in our history? Uh, it would be hard to oversell it. I mean, there is a lot of hype around this game and this series, but can you blame us? Like, hockey fans, every season there's a Canadian team in the playoffs. For basketball fans, we've got the Raptors. That's it. It's live, you know, with the ups and downs of this team. And for 24 years, it's been mostly downs. But this year is different. And uh, to chat about that, I'm joined by Raptors super fan, Terry Hussey. Now, we've had Terry on a lot lately to talk about politics, but I think the only thing you like more than talking politics is talking about the Raptors. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Let's go all night. Uh, well, Terry, I know most of us have been watching this, uh, glued to our television screens, watching this thrilling playoff run, but you actually went and saw some of these games in person. Yeah, no, I had a friend who lived in Milwaukee, and we kind of had a deal that if the Bucks and the Raptors made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, that we would go up, watch some games in Toronto, and drive to Milwaukee. So it took till game seven against Philly and the last shot. But when that shot went in, my wife and I were like, okay, time to book some flights. <laughs> Amazing. So tell me about the trip and the games that you saw. So we flew up to see games three and four in Toronto against the Bucks. The Raptors were down 0-2. So that first game, double overtime, very stressful because if they lost, I mean, it was over. We weren't going to Milwaukee, but they won. And then they, went, then they won game four. And so we drove, rented a car, drove to Milwaukee, got the ferry across Lakes Michigan, hung out in Milwaukee. It's a pretty wild city. Went to game five at five serve form, the newest arena in, in the league. Beautiful facility. The Raptors are down 14 points, and we're like, okay, we just got to keep it close, just got to keep it close. And then they started to chip away, chip away. Then they took the lead. Then they won the game, and we were like, oh, my God, we just won. We need to get out of here quickly in Raptors gear, right? <laughs> It was a great experience, though. It, it feels like magic watching it happen, even on television. But how did it feel for you to see that in person? It really, one of the reasons that my wife and I, and we love sports, is a thing we share together. Uh, we wanted to see Kawhi Leonard in person. And in Game 3 and Game 5, we watched it happen twice. This guy just decided, we're not losing. And he just took the games over. And I'd never seen anything like that in my life. It was unbelievable to watch in person. Well, we're going to be watching this, uh, of course, all basketball fans across the country will be watching tonight. But let's just chat about this series briefly. It's kind of a David versus Goliath thing. They're up against the Warriors, maybe the best basketball team ever. What do you think? Do the Raps have a chance? If Kevin Durant doesn't play, the Raptors have a really good chance. One of the big stars on the yeah. Warriors, but he's out with an injury. So game one tonight, I think the Raps can take it. I believe they're going to win tonight. Uh, I think if they can win the first two games at home, Scotiabank Arena is wild for the Raptors. So if they can hold home court advantage, I think the Raptors have a really great chance to shock the world, which I'd love to see. And Terry, listen, you, Chris, here are the good luck charms of this team very clearly. Uh, you better be watching tonight. Because... Oh, yeah, I'm going to be watching until the wee hour. It's going to be a little bleary-eyed tomorrow morning, but I don't care. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. We've all been losing a lot of sleep, but it's been so worth oh, it. Oh, yeah, totally worth it. I mean, they're in the finals. It's the first time ever. The world has got its eyes on Canada. What a great opportunity. So amazing. Terry, thanks for your time. Man. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, we are here at Gonzaga High School. There is a big game going on. You know, everybody here is going to be watching the Raptors when they're done tonight. This is the Mark Jackman Memorial Basketball Tournament. We'll be talking about that just a little later in the show. But one last word about the Raptors. If you want to watch tonight on the biggest screen in town, then the Cineplex in Mount Pearl is showing tonight's game and all the games in the finals for free. Probably a little bit bigger than the TV screen down in the basement. Pretty cool. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Uh, thanks, Zach. Just a wee bit bigger. Yeah. That's a great idea to have it, it at the Cineplex. Yeah, there'll be a lot of people in Mount Pearl. I don't know about you, but if, for those of us old enough to remember, but it really does feel like a 92 when the Blue Jays uh, won the first World Series. So it's almost like the whole country. Yes, everybody of, in the country yeah. came and rallied around, and you can see that happening with the yeah, Raptors. It is Raptors. a big deal. <laughs> Dear uh, 2018, 50% of the rivers in Newfoundland and Labrador were in the critical zone. Well, everyone agrees last year was a bad one for salmon fishing with a lot fewer fish. So as the season opens this weekend, the big question is, will 2019 be any better? The answer is coming up.
With the opening of the salmon angling season upon us this weekend, a glimmer of hope for the species despite a bad year in 2018. Returning salmon appear to be on the rise somewhat. Don Ivany is with the Atlantic Salmon Federation, the director of programs for our province, and we've reached him, as you can see, in Cornerbrook. So, Don, what's important about the data? Well, I, I think for the first time in at least four or five years now, uh, we have seen uh, an increase in returns uh, to North American uh, rivers uh, in a vicinity of about 30 percent. Uh, that varies from region to region, but again, it's the first increase we've seen uh, since we've seen the sharp declines in the last several years, uh, at which time DFO put in place some fairly strict management measures, and uh, we're hoping that we're beginning to see the results of, uh, of those measures this year. Now, obviously, there's a whole bunch of different ecological factors that would explain this. Last year, anglers, as you well know, were only allowed to keep one fish, one fish retention. Does that play any role in this at all? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, in terms of the number of fish that are harvested overall, uh, I mean, when you combine all anglers, they have uh, harvested significant numbers of fish in the past. So uh, every time uh, there's a reduction in retention, especially when fish stocks are low, it, it means there's more fish to make it to the spawning grounds and that bodes well for future years. So we're hoping with the measures that have been in place for the past several years, that in the next several years, we'll continue to see positive growth like we've seen this year. Uh, many anglers hope to uh, wet a line, as we say uh, this weekend. What kind of season do you foresee with, as far as the measures go heading into 2019? Is it going to be very similar to last year as far as one fish goes? Well, uh, right now with the management plan that DFO have, have in place, uh, anglers can retain a maximum of three fish, as I understand. So, uh, you know, uh, there will be an in-season review done by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and if need be, they will do some uh, adjustment at that particular time. Um, I think, uh, by and large, most anglers seem fairly pleased with the, uh, with the plan this year. There's more opportunities to, to take a couple of fish home. Uh, but there's still some uh, anglers and some conservation groups uh, uh, have a little bit of concern with the plan in that uh, last year, uh, 2018, 50% of the rivers in Newfoundland and Labrador were in the critical zone. So even with the increases that we've seen uh, uh, from, from the previous year, uh, or the, from last year, I should say, uh, you know, some of our rivers are still not doing well. And unfortunately, anglers are also going to be now permitted to retain fish from those rivers that are not doing well. So that, that won't bode well for future uh, returns. So that's one of the concerns that we have. Okay, and of course, the weather's always a factor if the rivers uh, run hot or run low. So we'll keep an eye on the season. Listen, Don, appreciate your time and uh, good luck this, uh, this season. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate it very much. The Coast Guard has a brand new icebreaker, the first in 25 years. This new ship was christened today in St. John's and it's named after a pretty cool woman. Here now's Peter Cowan explains. This new ship is an important one for the Coast Guard for two big reasons. Let's first talk about the capabilities. This is the first new icebreaker in 25 years for the Coast Guard. It's needed because many of the other ships are getting old. They need to go in for repairs. So the Captain Molly Cool is one of the newer ships that's going to be sent out to service. Because even though it's new to the Coast Guard, it's not actually new. It's an 18-year-old used ship that the Coast Guard purchased from Sweden, gave it a new coat of paint, and now it's pressed into service. Uh, these interim uh, capacity icebreaker will provide us with uh, the sustainability to continue with our services while our other vessels are getting refitted or vessel life extension. Well, who was Captain Molly Cool? She was the very first female captain in all of North America. She is from New Brunswick and she was remembered today as a trailblazer. She wrote the exams in 1939 and for five years she captained a ship up and down the Bay of Fundy. Today, her sister was here all the way from California to remember her as a trailblazer. She just didn't feel that men should have the opportunities, that women should be just as well off as men. It really annoyed her that they had things that she didn't, that have opportunities. It's fitting that one of the captains on board this ship is also a woman, but her and her crew aren't going to have a lot of time to celebrate. They've got to get this ship ready to head up to the Arctic. They won't be back until the fall. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Molly Cool was quite yes, the pioneer. The, the men annoyed her, as <laughs> sometimes happens. <laughs> 
Well, one new face in Dwight Ball's cabinet, Brian War from Springdale. Otherwise, Premier Dwight Ball plays it safe with his cabinet picks. Let's get back to the top political story. Today's unveiling of the new provincial cabinet. Premier Dwight Ball spoke to reporters about his decisions on who will run the various government departments. And the Premier also spoke about one of the first things that's going to happen after the House of Assembly reopens within the next two weeks. Take a look. Well, you know, uh, we'll introduce the budget and there'll be a, a series of debates which will go through line by line, estimates, as always happens. We anticipate a similar, very similar process. So, you know, one of the things that will be interesting is once the debate starts, where the opposition will go. Uh, what we've heard clearly from all opposition uh, leaders right now and, and, and the independents, of course, is that there's a willingness to collaborate and cooperate with the budget, but we'll go through that process. Of course, we're going to introduce the same, pro the same budget that we uh, brought to the House of Assembly back in, in April, and we'll introduce that budget quite early, day two, I'm anticipating once we get back into the House. On election day, voters sent you a message that they wanted to change. Why have you decided to basically not make any changes uh, in your cabinet? On election day, the voters actually said that they, uh, they supported uh, 20 seats for us, which was the most of any political party. Uh, they also gave us the, uh, the majority of the popular vote. Uh, so that was the message that came for me to put in place uh, a cabinet. And with that, I get the opportunity to put in a cabinet uh, to deliberate and, and do the work of government. What I put in place is one of experience, one of consistency and stability. Uh, the budget will come quite early, and so many of the ministers, it's important to have that level of experience when you're uh, debating that, that budget. So today we have one new member, uh, that being Brian War, of course, and Brian comes with uh, a lot of experience as well. So we have a very experienced, uh, stable cabinet here. So even though you lost 10 seats, you think that voters have confidence in your team? Well, what we've lost was seven seats from uh, 27 Sorry. with our speaker. And so, we've, uh, of course, we've got some new, two new members as well. So uh, what I have, what the message that came from the people of our province, as I said on election night, was that they're asking us to work in collaboration and, working, and work together. And I, what I've seen from members of the House of Assembly of all 39 others that have been elected is a, is a willingness. This is not new. We're seeing this is the fourth minority government that we've seen across the country, three in Atlantic Canada, 
and Nova Scotia with a two-seat majority. So this is not new uh, to the political environment in, in Canada. It's a little new for Newfoundland and Labrador. We've had this once before in our history. So I'm looking forward to it. I see significant opportunities. I don't see this as a, a challenge at all. I see this as an opportunity for people in our province. Why do you keep Labrador and Indigenous Affairs for yourself when it seems clear Labrador is not happy? Uh, well, it's, uh, they, it is my job as Premier of the province, as I said before, is that we work as a government to government relationship with indigenous with indigenous uh, groups within Labrador and within our province. Uh, the first premier to put in place a, uh, uh, a leaders round table on indigenous affairs. And so that's been very successful. So those that know me, you know, we continue, there's work to be done. And right now that portfolio, those, uh, those responsibilities will remain for my office. Make sense to try and you know put that job with someone closer on the ground, say Ms. Dempster or, or Perry Trimper. As I said, right now we work very closely with all MHAs. Uh, it's important right now that we not make too many changes. Uh, as you know, she's uh, Ms. Dempster is also acting in municipal affairs and environment, so we'll use that experience there. So for now, uh, you know I'll be taking on and continue to take on as we get through this budget process, uh, the responsibilities for Labrador, Indigenous affairs, also intergovernmental affairs, and the work that goes on the Premier's office. It's quite busy. I'm just uh, I'm just happy to get a cabinet beyond me uh, today and. It's been an extra extraordinary uh, busy three weeks or so now, or two and a half weeks since the election, and we've been doing quite a bit of work, and it's time now to get the machinery of government back working for people of our province. You're watching Gonzaga versus Gonzaga out here on the basketball court. Different generations of the Vikings team taking each other on, but this game is about more than basketball. It's about a schoolmate, a teammate, and a friend by the name of Mark Jackman. We'll tell you more after the break. East Coast Trail Association was born 25 years ago. It was 1994, and this was the start. I probably shouldn't have worn this on the hike today, but at the big Trail Razor hike on Saturday, June 8th, you can do the East Coast Trail your way. Join CBCNL at the annual Trail Razor hike in support of the East Coast Trail Association. 
The fun starts in Bay Bulls with five hikes to choose from. It's skipping. Register online at eastcoasttrail.com. A lot of people hiking last weekend, so nice, making weekend plans for this weekend. So we're looking to, uh-oh, is that a? <laughs> it's not going to be terrible. Uh-huh. Light yeah. jacket? No, that's yeah. what we love to hear. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be terrible. Yeah, no. That's where the bar is. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's where my bar is. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to be a washout, so that's good news. Yes. Uh, we are going to look towards Saturday to start. And uh, that system that is bringing all of that messy weather to Labrador is going to start to affect us as well. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, future tracker showing some uh, showers moving through tomorrow night, as I mentioned, just a little bit earlier for the island. And then into Saturday, or rather uh, Sunday is where we're looking right now. Uh, we should see some clearing skies, so that's certainly good news, uh, at least through the first half of the day. Still unsettled up through Labrador, though, but uh, like I said, some sunshine to start into uh, into Sunday. So here's a look at your Saturday forecast. Lab City, uh, either rain or snow, and that's essentially going to be the story for most of Labrador, just depending on those temperatures. So during the day, rain changing over to the chance of uh, snow into the evening hours. Uh, it's the first half of Saturday, or at least most of Saturday, for the West Coast looking lovely. 16 degrees for Cornerbrook, 11 in Port of Basque with some onshore flow there. Uh, and then the chance of showers for Grand Falls, Windsor. Now heading towards eastern Newfoundland and uh, the uh, Avalon. It does look generally gray with that chance of showers through the day. Temperatures, though, should still be in those double digits, a little bit cooler up through the Straits and St. Anthony, around 7 degrees. Now into Sunday, as I mentioned, we will start to see some clearing skies. This model putting in some cloud cover into the afternoon, anticipating that it will eventually move in, uh, but I'm thinking later on in the day as the next system moves in for Monday, and that's going to bring in that rain. That will be where we see most of the rain and up through Labrador as well. We're going to get out of that mess of that snow as we get into some uh, warmer temperatures, and so that means we should just see all rain, except for northern uh, uh, Labrador through the day. Into Tuesday, some clearing again, likely, just uh, a few cloudy periods, and then the next round moves in really over the next couple of days, at least the first half of the week, it's looking a little messy. So here's a here's a look at the forecast again tomorrow morning and wake up to some drizzle and some fog that should lift in the afternoon and then uh, some cloudy periods moving in late day 10 degrees 10 on Saturday again with that chance of shower Sunday does look like the best day right now. I have 16 degrees in there with some cloudy periods and then rain for the beginning of next week. But those temperatures and looking ahead even more so look like they should be in at least the uh, mid teens or, or rather at least the double digits, potentially even the uh, mid teens into next week. So that's the good news. Uh, Central Newfoundland 17 degrees tomorrow, 21 potentially on Sunday if we see plenty of sunshine and then that uh, rain again Monday, Tuesday. But those temperatures, like I said, going to stay quite mild between 18 and 20 degrees. Western Newfoundland, essentially the same forecast. Saturday looks sunny though, and then rain will move in on Sunday night into the beginning of Monday with some uh, clearing skies there as well. For Eastern Labrador, seven degrees tomorrow and rain again, some flurries towards the evening hours, and then we get back into those double digits heading towards the end of the weekend with sunshine and 15 degrees. And then again, with that system moving in, we're looking at those uh, uh, rain moving in. Essentially the same forecast for Western Labrador, sunshine on Sunday and 11 degrees. So when I come back, I will have details on your weather photo. Thanks, Ashley. And we're going to go back to basketball now. Well, earlier in the program, we told you the Toronto Raptors will play in their first NBA Finals starting tonight. Exciting night. And at Gonzaga High School in St. John's, there's a gym full of basketball fans who will no doubt be watching that game one. But right now, they've all got something else on their minds. Here now, Zach Gowdy is there joining us again. Uh, Zach, what is this tournament all about? Well, it's all about a young man named Mark Jackman. Mark went to school here at Gonzaga, was a big part of the basketball team. Mark graduated in 2014, 
Sadly, he never got to fulfill the promise of his young life. Mark was killed in a car crash the very next year. Now, ever since then, his friends and teammates have gathered here with a charity basketball tournament that helps to fuel a scholarship in his name. I'm joined by a teammate of Mark's, Liam O'Leary, right now. Uh, Liam, I know high school is starting to feel like a long way away from you guys, but how does it feel now when you get the team and friends of Mark's back together here every year? I mean, it's just a really great excuse to get everyone back together. And it's a lot of people that you don't really see all the time. And you know, you get back here, it's about Mark, but then you got all the positive things that came away from it, and you get to see everyone play some basketball and just have a good time. Uh, I saw the, on the way in here, there's a big picture of Mark out on the court. Uh, you know, when you were out on the court, do those sort of memories start coming back to you? Absolutely. Well, personally, me and Mark, we came off the bench, admittedly. But, you know, we would come in, and there's, there's a lot of memories there from Gonzaga and even just playing in the streets as friends and playing in elementary school and all that. So it means a lot. Now, uh, of course, you guys have been doing this tournament. This is an alumni tournament, different generations of the Vikings basketball team playing each other. But uh, you guys also have a scholarship in Mark Jackman's name. Just tell us about that. Yep, so we've got a scholarship that we give out each year, and it's to a student that uh, sort of exhibits a lot of the things that Mark exhibited. So it wasn't exactly athletics. But we also had, um, he was very bright in the classroom too, and he was very well-rounded. So we like to give it to someone that really exhibits all the qualities that Mark had, not only athletics. That's wonderful. And this tournament really helps to fuel that scholarship. Um, I know you guys have games throughout the weekend, and it is certainly open to the public. In fact, it's great, really, if people can come out and support that. Just, just tell us about that a little. Yeah, so, I mean, basketball's in the air. We've got the finals. We've got a good Canadian team in. So if you're looking for some basketball or you're not watching basketball, Come here and see some really good talent playing each other. We've got games all Friday evening, all day on Saturday. You get a great game of basketball here. Uh, entry by donation as well? Yes, absolutely. Donations are always welcome to help the charity and help the fun. Yep. Really a good that you guys do this. Liam. Thank you so much for chatting with My me. My pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, again, if you're catching basketball fever, then really this is the place to be here this weekend. The big stories on television, but right here in St. John's, something special happening as well. Reporting live at Gonzaga, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Oh. Not just humans that enjoy the beautiful yeah. weather. Way too easy. <laughs> it's uh, Pooch Cove. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Oh. Sorry. No, that was good. I'll tell oh. you exactly where this photo was taken and who this dog is when we come back.
Welcome back once again. Well, you don't have to travel to a galaxy far, far away to pilot the Millennium Falcon. No, you don't, but you will need to make a trip to California. And forget the kids. <laughs> We've got a new theme park that opens in Disneyland tomorrow, and it's built for all of the Star Wars nerds out there, including in Capture here. Capture that emotion again. When you first fell in love with Star Wars, we want you to have that feeling all over again. Now, the park is set on a planet called Batu. Wow, That's a fresh look at that. setting not seen in the movies. <laughs> Diehard fans will notice details like droid tracks and signs written in fictional languages. <laughs> <laughs> the plan is to evolve the park like a franchise with changing stories and characters. Another park is set to open in Florida later this summer. Well, I bet you that'll be popular. It's going to and pack them in, I suspect. Yep. I always wanted to fly in one of those machines. <laughs> well, look, you can have an assistant, Debbie. You? You'll have people or That's bots. Great. Very popular, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So photo? we have a gorgeous shot again. We do. <laughs> Look at him. He's so cute. Might be a girl, actually. I don't actually know what it, who it is. Uh, but it was taken in Grand Falls, Windsor. Now, where is that? <laughs> where is that? Yes. No, Grand Falls, Windsor. I don't. I'm trying to think now where oh. Grand Falls, Windsor. <laughs> like, there is, there is a, uh, some kind of a structure over there? Yes. Something yeah. back there, yeah. Although yeah. Well, Marianne there. will have to let us know. She will. Marianne Weir sent us this photo of Tilly enjoying the evening. Like I said, not just humans that wouldn't, enjoy beautiful weather. Wouldn't you just love to get your hands in there and give I a little know. tickle? I know. Coat so is cute. gorgeous. So beautiful. Yeah. Well, if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. And he might just enjoy some sunny weather on maybe Sunday. Yep, yeah, on Sunday. So, all for great. sure. All right. Got there's a basketball game on. Yeah. Yeah. You gonna watch it? Uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. Part of it. Part of it, yeah. PVR we'll it. It'll be late. And yeah, don't listen late. to the radio. Morning, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's our show. Thanks very much for being with us. See you tomorrow. Good night.